in today's show. We're talking NBA draft with Nathan Grubel of Draft Deeper. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. I'm recording this before Game 6 of the NBA Finals, so either, hey, congratulations, Golden State Warriors, another well-deserved title. You guys have been fantastic. Or, oh my God, I can't wait until Game 7. It's going to be an absolute cracker. I have no idea because I'm recording this before Game 6, but, you know, I will talk about the NBA Finals results once we hear about it on the next show after this one. But we're talking with Nathan today, Nathan Grubel of Draft Deeper. We're going to be covering players like Tari Eason, Chet Holmgren, Johnny Davis, Caleb Houston, Dominic Barlow, and Hunjung Lee. Lots of very, very interesting players to talk about. So, Warney. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring him in now. Nathan Grubel of Draft Deeper. Welcome. Thanks, Josh, for having me on. I, I, I appreciate you thinking of me and, and some of the kind words that you've shared with some of the other No Ceilings guys. I'm, I'm thankful to be here. Yeah, there's lots for us to talk about. We've got a a pretty jam-packed show today with uh, prospects, some uh, pretty high-profile prospects we're going to be talking about today. And everyone knows the drill, but unless this is the first time you're listening, if it is, hey, welcome, good to have you here. What we do on these NBA draft prospect shows is ask the host, the draft analyst, hey, who is a prospect that you are higher on than consensus? I'm really interested to dig into this one because I'm lower on this guy than consensus, and that is Big Johnny Davis, the 6'6 guard out of Wisconsin, 20 years of age, Nathan why is he good? <laughs> there, there's a lot of reasons why he's good, Josh. But okay. I, I just want to get into really the point that brings me back to everything else, which is I can't think of another player in this lottery grouping that we could talk about out of all the press prospects that we could possibly talk about tonight who had a higher load to carry on both offense as well as defense, right? Like, To be not only a 20-plus points per game score at the college level in the Big Ten, which is one of the best conferences in all of college basketball, he also had to go out there and guard the other team's best perimeter player every single night. So you throw in the fact that he had to do so much offensively to carry a team where he basically didn't have any other shooters around him. It was like Brad Davison and then whoever else they wanted to throw out there. And then defensively, just carrying so much responsibility shows the playmaking flashes, the scoring flashes. I don't know how you can't like Johnny Davis, but I'm curious why why you're lower on him than consensus. Okay, so yes, he carried a huge load. 33% usage. He scored 20 points per game in 34 minutes. I just look at a player like that. I go, he's, I don't, he's never going to be asked to carry an offensive load like that, right? He's never going yeah. to be a 30% usage guy in the NBA. So I can throw out the volume stuff there a little bit. Rebounding, really, really good. Defensively, I, I get that. Um, but... You know, he only shot 31%. And we've heard I've heard this argument before. Shout out to Carson Edwards. Oh, he just had to do too much. He had to take all the tough shots. So that's why they, the shots didn't go. And now he actually is going to be a really good scorer and good shooter. And obviously, he wasn't. And he was not good at all. And that didn't carry out. Not, not to say that won't happen with Davis, but I have a little bit of skepticism about that. Oh, well, once he doesn't have this large load, then he'll just be this knockdown shooter and this great option. To me, he looks like a guy who could be Josh Hart. And there's nothing wrong with Josh Hart. But I don't think I want to spend a top 10 pick on someone like that who's going to be, to survive, have to be a lower usage offensive player. Not sure what the level of you know, ball handling or pick and roll creation ability is going to be there. Um, is he, if he's going to be put into a situation where he's a spot up shooter, do they actually go in? Because again, we, have, we haven't seen it and there might be reasons for that, but there also might not be. So I look at a guy that, hey, he had to carry so much and so much volume was pumped into what he did and that's not going to happen in the NBA. So I just don't see those roles being similar. Now, you could tell me you can see that translatability and I'm here to listen because my opinion on Davis <laughs> is, is not particularly high at the moment. So what about what I said there where you go, Josh, you're an idiot. Like, what are you talking about? Like, what, what there was, was off, do you think, or you can convince me on? 
So the you, the thing you and I have an agreement on is the three point shooting. You mentioned how he did shoot a lower percentage than we like to see at the college level from the three point line. And I echo some of those sentiments. I think he's going to have to adjust to the NBA line his first few years. He might not be a 34, 35% three point shooter, but there's nothing about his mechanics that tell me he can't get there. Everything else, though, once he gets a screen at the top of the floor, once he's able to kind of work his way downhill, get inside the arc, very underrated playmaker at Wisconsin. Some of the assist numbers might not reflect that, but, you know, if you're looking for an assist, the other guys on the team have to hit the shot for that to actually that, that count is true. towards your stat line, <laughs> That right? is true. So you, you go back and watch the film and, and some of the cross-court passes, some of the things he did out of pick and roll in terms of passing – I think go back and watch some of that film. You might might be a little surprised with some things that he showed there. The scoring, the pull-up scoring, the maturity. I love when I can evaluate a guy and he can get to that 20-plus points per game mark and he doesn't have to do it taking five, six, seven, eight three-point shots per game. The fact that he can do it, get to the line, rack up those points the old-fashioned way shows a lot of craft that we don't usually see from prospects when they're coming out of college at this level. So... Those are some reasons why I still remain high on Johnny Davis. And we didn't touch on the defensive end that much either. I know I said that I said that he had to go out there and guard the best perimeter matchup every single night. But really, I think he might be undersold a little bit on that end of the floor. I project him to be able to guard one through three. I love the measurements that came in. He's near 6'6". I don't know, man. I love a lot of what I've seen from Johnny Davis. And you mentioned the volume stuff. Isn't that sort of a boon in his favor that he won't have to carry that much of a load? Like, we... We ha- all, all we've seen him is that he's had to go out there and do every single thing for his team. When he's able to be like a third, fourth option, I think a lot of that volume is going to jump up in his favor, minus some of the three-point stuff that I think we'll eventually get. Yeah, look, I, I he's obviously not going to have the volume, and that, that could work out. It could also not. Like, to me, he's a player sure. that's like... The, the worry I have, I guess, is Dylan Brooks, right? A, a guy that thinks he should have 28% usage, <laughs> Um, but realistically, you should just shut up, sit in the corner, and exert your energy defensively. And, and Brooks does well defensively, and Davis could do that. But if Davis has the Brooks yeah. mentality of like, no, no, I'm the guy that needs to take all of these shots, even when I've got significantly better teammates around him, that is a real problem to me. And I, I, I worry a little bit about that, and I worry again, do I want to take Josh Hart, Dylan Brooks at pick eight or pick nine? I don't know where you have him on your board, but I've seen people have him inside the top 10. And to me, like, I don't have him... Yeah, outside the top 20 or anything like that, but he's around that 14 to 15 or 14 to 16 sort of area to me. And I would have other guards ahead of him. Where, How high are you? Like in comparison to players around that area, guards around that top area where we're talking um, Sharp or Griffin, Daniels, Matherin, um, those players, where, where is he in comparison to them? I have Davis at six. So cool. I would have Davis ahead of a number of those players. I guess I just believe in the tough, not just the tough shot making ability, but also the playmaking off of it. I trust the decision making a lot more from, like you made the Dylan Brooks comparison. They, they are similar players in style, but I trust what Davis is going to do from a decision making perspective more than I do Brooks. And the Josh Hart comparison. There are some similarities there, in ter- especially in terms of the rebounding for a guard. Like yeah. Josh Hart probably is the only other guard in the NBA who can compare on, on that front from a numbers perspective. But I remember watching Josh Hart at Villanova. He didn't have the same scoring crap that Johnny Davis did at, at Villanova. The way that Davis can rise up over defenders and knock down some of those tough shots, some of the post game that he has. One of the reasons why I wanted to go watch Davis live in person was I wanted to see – separation could he actually create shots that looked better in person to me than how tough i thought they were on film he checked that box against the Rutgers defense the trapezoid of terror one of the toughest places to play in college one of the better defensive teams in college he checked those boxes for me i love the separation that i saw i thought he looked like a better athlete than he was giving credit for and then i already mentioned some of the defensive playmaking flashes so just being a a more complete guard that i think he was given credit for that's why i'm valuing him so highly I'll tell you what you've done. You've convinced me to at least go back and re-look at, re-look at it and see if you know, my opinion gets changed on Johnny Davis. So I will do that. But before we get on to the next prospect, I've got to tell you that Bet Online. .net is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including 
maybe Game 7. I don't know if there is going to be a Game 7, but if there is a Game 7, BetOnline.net will have all of the odds available there. They'll definitely have Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Finals between Colorado and Tampa Bay, or Major League Baseball, UFC, MMA, boxing, whatever sport you can think of, BetOnline will have it for you. It is your continued source, BetOnline, for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in the action. BetOnline is where the game starts. Let's talk about players or a player that you are lower on than consensus. And this is a guy that many people love and a lot of the models love and starting to see him fall a little bit at the moment. And that is Tari Eason, the 6'9", 6'8", forward, 21 years of age out of LSU. He averaged almost 17 points per game. Last season, really good steal, huge steal numbers, really good yeah. block numbers, um, pretty good scoring numbers, much like Johnny Davis, extremely high usage, um, good rebound, his free throws at an astonishingly good rate considering how often he got to the line. There's a lot to be interested in there with to me when looking at those defensive numbers and then looking at how much he got to the line and how much he hit them. But why why are you down on him? Because all of the statistical indicators are, are pretty much pointing up with Tari Eason. So when I said that I was down on him in relative to consensus, when you and I had that conversation, it's it's funny how things have shifted oh, in the has. public space, mm. right? Now his stock is sort of in line more with where I would have him. I have him 18th on my board. And I think if you're getting him anywhere in that like mid first round all the way out to you know 23 where he's being projected to go to the Philadelphia 76ers right now, should he fall that far? I think that's tremendous value for him. And, and it's more so I would rather pick him there than in the top 10, because I have more questions about Tari Eason, at least when you watch the film. What's he going to do in the NBA in, in the half court? In, in high leverage situations and half court offense, I have questions about his three-point shooting, even though it trended upwards later in the year, and the free throw shooting trended upwards later in the year. I have questions about how the shot looks and the mechanics. I don't trust him as a pull-up shooter. And then when you look at all of his numbers around the basket, all the finishing numbers are tremendous, but go back and watch what they were on the film. It was a lot of wide open dunks, a lot of transition finishes, and I get it. And, and this is something I've admitted on my podcast feed. Maybe I'm underselling the fact that because he can get those wide open opportunities, maybe I should, maybe I should put more stock in the finishing but when i go back and i watch the tape and i see what happens when he has to go up against defenders who are similar size to him or bigger i don't see that same touch that i would want to see from a guy who we're projecting to essentially live in the paint at the nba level so i think some of the offense might be a little fool's gold when we talk about the numbers versus the film defensive side of the ball steal rates block rates absolutely tremendous one of the best defensive playmakers that we have in this class but he's also a big 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 risk taker on that end of the floor and he makes some gambles i don't love those guys who don't have what when it comes to an iq and a decision making standpoint on the defensive end are they going to play within the team or are they going to just be a riverboat gambler out there and put his put his team in a bad situation should he not get that steal or should he not get that block that he's going for i want to see more fundamentals from him at the same time he could be coached up in those ways, right? Like he, he could go to the NBA within two years. He's gone to a scheme. He's developed that chemistry with his teammates. He's become a better decision maker on that end of the floor to where he is one of the defenders at that best defenders at that combo forward spot. So I might have some reservations with him that he could entirely prove me wrong on on both ends of the floor and he could return top 10 value. I'm just not willing to definitely bet on that and take him in that range. I'd love him more in the mid first. Yeah, he was going in that 9 to 10 zone initially, but he has fallen, and I've got him at 17 at the moment. Um, okay, so we're in the same spot then. Yeah, we are. Look, I, 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 I like him. I didn't like him in that top 10 area, but I, I like him in this you know, late lottery, early non-lottery type of type of area. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm, the usage is never going to be that high in the NBA. That's you know, I can guarantee that. But the defensive <laughs> stuff, this defensive stuff's interesting. But the thing I worry about is, like, what's his position? Like, is he? Does he have to play at times as a small ball five? Could he ever play at the three? I, I have some doubts about that. I, does the shooting ever come? I, that's there's some of my concerns there. But you're looking at what he does, like a Jeremy Grant career path. I, I don't think he's completely out of the realms of possibility. Nope. It, it took a lot for Grant to get there, obviously, and it took going to a, a terrible team in order to bump his usage. But Eason's got a lot of those interesting things, and, and picking in that area, I think, is pretty. It's pretty interesting in terms of if that value can can turn around or, or be 
be at the level that maybe some people thought a few weeks ago where he look he could very easily end up being one of the best 10 players in this draft class but yeah I like you um, I'm a little bit a little bit softer on him now this other guy is the next guy we're going to talk about is obviously a much talked about prospect and I haven't talked about him yet so it's time to do it it's Chet Holmgren he 20 years of age everyone knows the deal on him seven foot forward slash center Gonzaga the number one prospect or number one talk about prospect from this class for years, whether he's the number one guy on your board now, that's not really the point here. He's probably going to go in that top three. His numbers are insane, like block rate, rebound rate, good assist, solid steals, good three-point shooting, although I'm not sure he's this good of a three-point shooter where he shot 39% overall. Let's get the elephant or maybe the giraffe neck out of the way now. Is he too skinny for the NBA? I don't think so. Um, I, I get that the body is the biggest concern with Chad Holmgren, but not every player at his size with his frame coming in also plays as hard and as aggressively as he does, right? Like even when he gets knocked back or he gets knocked down, he gets right back up and he's ready to hop back into the play and give it his all next possession after next possession after next possession. I think that heart and that character really matters. And the other thing too, that I don't hear a ton of people talk about when it comes to his body, he... He may have been the tallest player on the court at previous levels that he's played in, but I don't think he's ever really been the biggest or he's he's never really been the strongest. And I think the fact that he's learned how to play through some of those quote unquote physical shortcomings, I think will only help him as he keeps going up into higher levels, especially when he gets to the NBA. Cause he was one of the most efficient players by the numbers on both ends of the floor in college basketball. So it didn't affect him playing for program at Gonzaga where they didn't just feast off of lower teams in the, in the WCC conference. They played against many top teams, including Duke throughout the year. And there was never a moment where I thought he was physically overwhelmed during the college year. So I get that he's not going to be able to hang with Joel and Beads and the Nicole Jokic's of the world. How many of these centers coming in though, truly can hang with those guys? Right? How many guys, so that, how many guys why... in the NBA can do it? Like it, <laughs> Embiid can't hang with Jokic. Jokic can't hang with Embiid. Like, they can't handle each other. Like it's 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 not like an easy thing to be able to do. Yeah, Rudy Gobert gets in trouble against these guys. Like this is not an easy thing to do. And it's not like when you're watching Chet in college that he's going up for a block and someone just puts their hand out and he flies out of the way. Like he gets in their face and he he, he throws it right back at him. And yeah. it, it's very easy. And I think it's, it is a bit lazy at times. But look at look at him. Look how skinny he is. Those ankles are going to snap. Like that's not how ankles work to begin with. And it's just it hasn't had any impact. I don't think really on his play this year or other years yeah. at higher levels, at high school, at AAU, at international tournaments. It's never had an impact. Like People might think, oh, look how skinny he is. I'm going to go at him. It doesn't work. It's just, it doesn't happen. Like You can't actually go through him and just be he ends up being a piece of tissue paper that you can push through. It just hasn't happened that way. Yeah. Will- I, I would be concerned about the body if he had like an injury history. Yeah. Right? Like That's where I would be more concerned. But he, he doesn't have an injury. People talk about him like he has an injury history. He really doesn't. He's been healthy and he's learned how to play through it. The other thing that I think gets some lazy analysis with Chet is that people look at him and go, well, look, look, he's seven foot. He weighs 150 pounds. He doesn't. But like he's obviously really skinny. Um, therefore, he must be uncoordinated. And he's going to have no ability to switch onto the perimeter. He's going to just have to stand around like Sean Bradley and block shots at the rim and not be able to do anything else. And that is just completely false, in my opinion. So can you do you agree with that? Can you dispel that notion that he is only like a paint defender who has no chance against these other guys on the wing? Because yeah, it's always going to be tough for a seven footer to guard a six foot one hyper speed point guard. But Chet is I, not is not the bottom level of those guys that do that. Yeah, I don't think he want him in in a hyper switchable scheme. But at the same time, as, as Shaq would say, he's not barbecue chicken out there, right? No. When he gets alone with somebody else in the perimeter, I I think the IQ and the feel stuff is incredibly special with Chet. He might be the smartest player in this draft class, and that's another thing too. Unless you're really going back and digging through a lot of the film. It's not something that's really said a lot about his game either, but his recognition, his timing, his anticipation, his awareness, his discipline, all of those things wrapped up on defense help him to play against some of those smaller guys. If he can figure out what they're doing and where they're going, he can figure out how to get to those spots first to meet those guys versus always being surprised at what the opposing perimeter player is doing, which is something that big men struggle with, especially at the NBA level. if They aren't really there to, to meet some guys on the perimeter and switches. Next thing or last thing with Chet is, I think these are legitimate concerns, is what 
what is his offensive upside? What can he do in a half court situation? Because you know you, we look at the top three. If we're going to say you know uh, Paulo and Jabari and Chet are the top three, like I feel confident that if Paulo gets the ball, like we can run an offense through him and he can generate shots. Jabari, I'm not so sure, and I'm not so sure with Chet how he works in a half court offense. He can grab and go. He can run transition. He can run run the break. But yeah, is he a guy where it just has to be like? almost like Porzingis off screens and hitting deep threes. Like He's not that level of shooter. So where does he fit in a half-court offense? I think he's going to be better in the pick-and-roll game that people give him credit for. That's pick-and-roll, pick-and-pop. He was a really good cutter in college. You mentioned some of the transition scoring as well. And then I think if you get him around the elbows and you give him some touches, some chances to actually get some of those shots and opportunities in those areas that Paolo did and Jabari did, I think he can excel in some of those areas. I think he's going to show a little bit more movement shooting things that I think people realize that he's capable of. And if anybody has some questions about how his offense might translate or there being more in his bag, go, go watch the Mike Schmidt's film breakdown that, that he did with Chet Holmgren. That gives you a great idea of Chet thinks he has more offensive upside to his game. And I do too. I've seen him. And we've seen him. At, I should say, I know ceiling some pre-workout stuff, some pre-game He's taking shots and, and, and getting himself in situations, Josh, where he's practicing stuff and, and some perimeter shots, almost like Kevin Durant. And it, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty wild to watch. But I think he's more comfortable than given credit for. And I just wonder if he had some of the same touches as those two other guys and some of those same offensive opportunities, instead of being the garbage cleanup guy that he was at times for Gonzaga, I wonder if we'd be having some different opinions shared in the public space on Chet's offense. I have him, I've had him at number one all through this process. I'm almost undoubtedly going to keep him at number one all through this process. Do you have sure, him? Man. Do you have him at number one? Yep. Yeah. I do. I've, there was, there was a point in like mid to late January where I'd, I slid Jabari Smith into that number one spot. But other than that, I've had Chet number one all year, and that opinion's only grown stronger for, for myself. Well, we are aligned with that one, but let's get on to some lower end prospects now. A guy that he's, you know, the, the, again, the size, the, the profile of this guy is really interesting. 19 years of age, six foot eight, wing from Michigan, Caleb Houston. This sort of player, this sort of size player is always going to be in demand. Unfortunately, the numbers don't look particularly good. 10 points in 32 minutes, 38% shooting overall, like putrid steal, assist, block numbers, low rebound numbers. Attempted a lot of threes. They didn't really go in. All the numbers are pretty rough here from Houston, but... The, the size, the position, the theory, I guess, gives some positivity to what he can do. Is that misplaced? Is that just like, oh, we hope because you are the perfect size that it works out? Like, Or is, is there a reason why it didn't particularly work as we wanted it to in Michigan? I, I don't think Caleb Houston's a good athlete. And I think that's really where a lot of it breaks down. I, I don't see some of the separation ability to get some of those shots off. He is... He's almost strictly like a movement shooter and he has to have enough space because if you try and run him off spots, you're going to succeed in doing so because he can't really get downhill well. There's no secondary playmaking chops to really speak of. They tried to put him in some of those situations in the pick and roll, had trouble turning the corner, and then when he tried to finish around the basket, he doesn't get off, up, up off the floor well. He's not strong. His shot was getting blocked. He wasn't able to finish around the basket like – you, you outlined a lot of great things, Josh, and he's one of those guys where, yeah, he has six foot eight size. He can potentially shoot over defenders, but if you ask him to do much of anything else, he can't really do it. And then if the shot's not going in, especially when you throw in some of the defensive concerns, what's he going to provide you on an NBA floor? And that's really, I think, where the first round case really fell apart. Now, he apparently, there's wild speculation he's got a promise. He's probably going to go late in the first round. Jesus. I wouldn't take him in that range, but... I, yeah, as, as you said, it's exactly as you said, man. You're really making a bet that that size plus the shooting is going to provide some tremendous value for you at some point in the rotation. I'm I'm not making that bet. He's a guy, I had him like top eight preseason, and he fell all the way into like the 40s on my board. It's one of those things that I talk about on this show all the time, either regarding draft prospects or talking about fantasy basketball, is that you if you're in a situation where you are getting a ton of shots and they're going in, and that's all well and good, but if they don't, yeah. What else do you do? And he was doing that in high school, and that was why he was you know, ranked so highly coming in. All the numbers looked good. He was number eight prospect coming in uh, to college on the ESPN 100 list. But 
they didn't go in and he didn't get that usage and he get, does nothing else. And when it doesn't happen, yeah. he, he, you're right, he can't secondarily create for others. The d- defense wasn't there. The athleticism wasn't there. He, the answer to the question is, what else do you do? And the answer is nothing. And that's a huge concern because it's not going to get easier at the NBA level. You're not going to be like, well, it's now the competition's easier, so my usage will go up and everything will go in and it'll be, it'll be great because it, it, it won't. It's as simple as that. And I really worry about that with him despite having that prototypical size because that's what it is at, at this point. It's a bet on size because, yeah, nothing, nothing worked out. It needs to change his game significantly and some of those things I don't think are necessarily improvable. I would agree. We're, we're in the same boat, man. We're in the same boat with Caleb Houston. Well, this is this next guy's a guy that I'm going to tell you, I, I, I don't know how to, how to judge it because we don't know how to judge overtime elite players. And this is Dominic Barlow. He's 19 years of age, 6'10", played with overtime elite. Again, this is the first year we're getting overtime elite prospects coming through. There's no real statistical translations because they didn't play in a real league or anything. They're not even like the G League Ignite. The size is there, almost 6'10", 7'3", wingspan. Um... But how do we assess these players? It's tough. It's absolutely tough. I agree with you. The overtime elite experiment is going to be fascinating to watch because for the questions that we could have about Dominic Barlow, who, when you think about the positives, that 6'10 size is real. He's a legit 6'10. He looked really big out there at the combine. If everything's going right for him, breaking right for him offensively, he's one of these modern forwards who can space the floor, finish out of pick and rolls, the interior finishing, all that great stuff. But if the shot's not going in, I have questions about the defense. I have questions about the motor. At the combine in those games, he wasn't rebounding the ball really well. That's a big concern for me if you're that size, but you're not aggressive on the glass on either end of the floor. I have questions about how some of the production is going to translate at the NBA level when he was playing against high school competition virtually the entire time, as you outlined with the overtime elite. And his feel for the game, if I think it's a little low, if I'm not seeing flashes of playmaking, some short roll playmaking, I'm not seeing those things and I'm betting on basically a six foot 10 guy who he needs to knock down 34 to 37% of his threes at the NBA level to really justify his value. I'm not going to take that guy in like the top 45 of the draft. Now, like 46 to 60, like the back end of the second, you want to take a flyer on somebody who's interesting. Absolutely. But I'm not going to take him in the top 45. At least I'm not personally, I just, I don't trust it. And maybe, maybe you and I could be wrong about that. Maybe the overtime elite was a better experiment than given credit for, but it's, one of those things we, we got to kind of see how it plays out. And I have as many questions about John Montero too. Yeah, exactly. We just don't know what Montero is going to do. We don't know what Barlow is going to do. Like happy to take flyers on them in the second round because you know, yeah. measurables and some of the stuff is interesting, but it's very hard to compare these guys. And, and you know, if these guys come out and really are massive in the NBA, we'll go, okay, well maybe we should be paying more attention to overtime elite. And maybe we're underrating the, the level of production and, and who they're going up against and how that all translates across. And the, the question, again, I talked about this a couple of days ago. I heard Rafael Barlow talk about this. Like if these sort of players who like went to overtime elite or got these high rated prospects, if they did a shade and sharp and didn't play at all, would we, would we feel better about them? Or you know how would we how would we view them? And we don't know. There's all these different ways to get into the NBA now, and how to compare and contrast them. Considering so much of it is new, like NBL pathways relatively new, G League Ignite's new, um, Overtime Elite is even newer. And there's going to be all these different things happening. And and how to judge those is is a really tough question. And we'll get more information this year, but we won't know for probably five, six, seven years as to how to judge this stuff more accurately than uh, than what we are at the moment. The last guy. <clears throat> Not someone I was planning on doing initially, planning on talking about initially, but when um, Corey was on last week and I asked him, give me your top five shooters in the draft, Honjung Lee's name came up and he had him, I think I think he had him at the top of, of the best shooters, or at least in that top five. So I thought, all right, let's do a little bit of a dive into Lee, the 22-year-old 6'7 guard out of Davidson, who shot 38% from three last season. He's a 40% career shooter across three years. He averaged almost 16 points per game. He attempted six threes over six threes per game. Is yeah, what, what's if Corey having him top five shooters in this class? Is that insane? Is that accurate? Would you do you agree with that? I I would agree with the shooting premise. Um, he is one of the best shooters that we have in this draft class. The problem is is I have questions about literally every other part of his game. And I think that's that's really where I differ from Corey and Albert. Shout out to those silly guys over the Draft Act podcast. That's where we differ on the evaluation. Like, there are some interesting passing flashes that Young and Lee can show off the bounce. 
I don't think he's going to be able to do those same things at the NBA level. I don't buy any sort of athleticism from him. He's very stiff handling the ball, very upright. If all Again, we come back to the same thing we talked about with Caleb Houston. If all he really is is a movement shooter, are you drafting that guy very high? Like, personally, I'm not. And if I have even more questions about his athleticism, despite him being tall, he's 6'7", but if I have even more questions about his athleticism than I do Caleb Houston, I'm not going to rank him very high in this class. And then defensively, I don't think he's going to be much of anything at all. Um, he, he's an interesting bet you can make as like an undrafted free agent guy. And if the shooting works out to the level that it did in college, where he's like a 40 plus percent three point shooter in the NBA. Sure. He's going to get a cup of coffee in the league. He might even have a chance to, to, you know, to earn a roster spot and then really have a role, but he's not a guy who I would want to draft. I think he's much better as like an undrafted free agent flyer. He averaged less than one steal and block combined, which is not a great indicator defensively. But we've seen plenty of these guys that that can work out. And yeah, your name, well, your name, look, my my mind goes to names like JJ Redick, Cole Corver, Seth Curry. But these are three of the best shooters, literally of all time, in terms of movement shooters and catching off screens and, and spot up shooters. And they're going to consistently hit 44, 45 percent. Joe Harris, another name in there. Like you're not doing anything else, yeah. but you're hitting these shots. And he's—I don't think he's quite at that level. Like we're not talking about a guy that's going to knock in 45 percent at the NBA level. Probably 39 percent. It's still really good, but you need to be at that absolutely insane level and getting off 10 or 12 three-pointers per 36 and hitting them at that level to to have a team be able to scheme around some of those other weaknesses. And while he might be good, and 40% is good, it's not 44, it's not 45. And that's that's the difference there. Duncan Robinson, another one of those guys, where yeah, if you hit him yeah. at 40, and we saw this year, Robinson went down to like 37%, couldn't play him. Like, he just he wasn't out there. When he hits him at 45, because it's so automatic, then fine. But if you start to drop off, then you can't do it. And these are not, you know, they're not all the same type of player, obviously, but their main skill is absolute elite shooting. And if you're not hitting them at, at an absolute elite level, I'm not sure what else you're doing. And that's that's the number one question I ask with anybody. What else are you doing if this thing doesn't work? And the, the question's got to remain, I think, here for Lee. And, and, and I agree with you 100%. And some of the other things that we could talk about with those other guys, like you mentioned Jay Jarrett, but like Seth Curry, like Seth Curry is also an undermated uh, pick and roll yeah, playmaker yep. as well. Like there, there are things that these other guys can do. And Duncan Robinson, you brought up as well. That was a great point you made about him just not being playable in some of these situations. He's not knocking down shots. Duncan Robinson's a bigger player and a better athlete than Lee is. So that's, that just goes to show you how hard it is. And I, I think if Lee would have shown a little bit more in the G League, the league camp, and he had, gotten some more opportunities and hit some more shots. I think we might be having a different conversation, at least in the public sphere with the fact that he got those, some of those shooting opportunities and he couldn't even take advantage of, of that situation. I don't know how well it's going to speak to his NBA case. I'm really interested to see. I think he's going to get some sort of undrafted free agent contract and summer league, and that'll be a huge opportunity for him. But you know, I'm, uh, maybe the end of a draft, uh, I, I take a look at him, but I think that's sort of where he's going to sit. Nathan, that brings us to the end of today's show. Tell everybody, A, where they can find you on social media, but also the work that you're doing latest episodes over on the podcast and other stuff that you got going on. Well, Josh, I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to be on the podcast today. You, anybody in your audience can follow me on Twitter at Draft Deeper. You can subscribe to the Draft Deeper podcast wherever you get your podcasts. I got an episode with Coach Adam Spinella coming up. We're going to go over my big board in draft tiers. I got an episode with Brian Kabrowski coming up. We're going to do some Intel stuff as well. I'll have plenty of mock draft stuff out next week. So definitely make sure you're tuned into my podcast feed and no ceilings, NBA.com, our free Substack newsletter Monday through Friday. We're pumping out content all the way up and through the draft. So definitely make sure you're tuning in on all fronts. Oh, I'm jealous that you got uh, coach spins to come on. Cause we were trying to work out him to come on this show. And then he, he bloody got married. I was like, what are you doing? Getting married at draft season. And I, I couldn't work out the time. Maybe, maybe I'll get him on next week now that he's back in action, but go and follow Nathan, go and subscribe to the draft deeper podcast as well. Nathan, thanks for coming on the show with me. Thank you, Josh. And then I'll do it for today's show. We'll be back next week with a bunch of mock drafts and some more prospects analysis because we've got to talk about still, who have we got left to talk about? Paolo Banchero, Bun- Banchero, my God. Paolo Banchero, AJ Griffin, Kennedy Chandler, Nikola Jovic, Jeremy Sohan. A lot of guys to talk about next week. I'm pumped to do it. Follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app here on YouTube. Thumb it up. Leave your comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.